So good evening or good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think the, probably the first thing you might notice is that I, I am not Antonio Amustategui, fortunately called away on a personal uh, affair and I was asked to stand in. My name is Peter Nemeas. I'm a, um, I'll be introduced in, in a couple of minutes, um, but I'm here to play Antonio's role in his absence. Um, I'm here with my colleague and, and hopefully my mentor someday, uh, Nazareth Romero. Um, together, um, we are going to go through today's event, which is um, of this year, our, um, our Iberian chapter meets with uh, a format, which is, you know, today we have the, the really an honor to, to welcome, to meet with WIPO and to, to speak with Ignacio de Castro, the director of IP Disputes Division, WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. So um, I think that it's a real treat to be able to, to be able to do this. Um, uh, before getting into this further, I mean, just to, you know, as you can see, we're going to be doing, if you haven't been to these things before, you'll see that this is really kind of a, a talk show format. So I get to say hello, and then we'll, Natharet, we'll, we'll kind of tee up the discussions, and then we'll, we'll really get to the interesting part, because I think those of us who are interested in these things um, will, will be interested to talk, to hear what Ignacio de Castro has to say. Um, just a, a, a bit of, of um, I guess, housekeeping before we get into this further. Um, I think, number one, I mean, this is being recorded, and the, the fact that you've registered, I think you were apprised of this, those of you who are attending, and so please keep in mind that it is being recorded, and, and the fact that you're here that would kind of manifest your, your consent to that. Okay. Um, I'd ask you also to try to, as, you, as you're listening and, and as questions come to you, um, the tool that will allow you to make your comments and any questions, and we'll do our very best to um, try to deal with them and, and field them and, and, and get them to uh, Ignacio um, to get back to you. So, um, you know, with that, I'm going to um, just pass over to, to Nazareth. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's a really pleasure being with all of you here uh, in this uh, Iberian chapter, Meet Wits. Uh, previously, for those who don't know which is Charter Institute for Arbitrators, let me draft in two quick lines. The CRB is an international charter to nestle the best and most qualified practitioner in arbitration, mediation, and other alternative dispute resolution tool and drivers. We have now over 18,000 uh, 18, members all over the world, and here our local area of Andorra, Portugal, and Spain, we are up to uh, 100 members. To allow us to propose our commitment, we organize events on a regular basis related to our commitment in these main scopes. Engage our members, and promote CRB behavioral and ethical standard and enroll new peers among IDR professionals. Today, uh, 9 June 2022, is the fifth this year in a program of nearly 15 uh, seminars, and we are going to perform it under the shape of what we call, as Peter said, a meets with series. Is a talk show format with significant players in the industry and about a relevant theme of concern for our CRB members involved in technology and or EP law and competition. The variant chapter uh, meets with the YPO World Intellectual Property Organization to talk about the Frank Fair, uh, Frank, uh, Frank Clauses. A framework in two economical sectors, life science, which involves biology, chemistry, and pharmacy, among others, and technology with a special relevance to IT and innovation. Uh, as you know, uh, we are recording, and you were aware when registered that this is event was going to be recorded. So then you were advised about this, and we assume, of course, we're 
your present that you are agree, so we go on. Um, this event will be uh, one hour and a half because there will be another seminar in this Zoom web page. But uh, in the face, after my introduction now, we will listen to Mr. Ignacio de Castro explanation guided by several dots accompanied by a presentation that you have now on your screen. And we were going to accompany our guest explanation with our comments and uh, queries in an open format. In the second part, we will call it questions and dabs from the audience and on the terms we expose. Uh, initial uh, describe engagement that uh, you need uh, to know a chat button that I see uh, you have just agreed uh, something. Chat button used for general discussion and any technical problems and question and answer in which if you have any kind of question, please write here and later in the second part of the seminar, uh, we will propose to our uh, panelists. Uh, Peter? Well, that, that's a wonderful explanation. I, I hope it's all clear. Um, look, let, let's get to the meat here, all right? I'm really very happy to, uh, to welcome uh, Ignacio de Castro um, from the WIPO. Um, Ignacio is the Director of IP Disputes and External Relations Division at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. He is a Spanish lawyer and an English solicitor. He holds an LLM degree from King's College London. And before, any, before joining WIPO in 2002, he practiced with law firms of Baker McKenzie in London at one of the fresh fields um, in the areas of international arbitration and litigation. Ignacio is a national of Spain. Um, I also want to explain a little bit who Nazareth is. Um, Nazareth um, is a um, uh, qualified member um, of CARB. She's an arbitrator, a partner in arbitration at the Escorial office of uh, Ovoli Furgoni Romero. She is an external expert um, at the Director General Justice of the European Commission. She is an expert in commercial investment uh, international arbitration. She is a white bull arbitrator and mediator. And this is her first seminar as a European branch committee member. Um, so very congratulate you for your, uh, for your election. Um, I think it's also kind of fair to, to uh, plug those of you who um, follow this, uh, that uh, she, she's also um, um, seeking election uh, to the board of uh, Arbital Women. Um, and ah, okay, you, thank you. Which is, <laughs> we are, we are election, now on election, so. election This is election season, so it's important <laughs> to put that plug in. Well, okay, um, go, 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 our scope and really thank you, Peter, for your kindly considerations. And please uh, let me a brief introduction to Peter Namnias. Rice is a fellow of Charter Institute of Arbitrators, a member of our uh, committee of the Iberian chapter CIRB. He's both a US attorney at law and a Spanish abogado admitted to the bars New York, New Jersey, and Madrid. He's in private practice based in Madrid where he focused on international commercial dispute resolution. So, uh, Peter, go on and introduce. <laughs> According to our, our, our interesting uh, uh, script we have here, it's now time for the talk. So, um, I think it's, it's time for Nathare to kind of, maybe you could kind of just tee this up. Yeah, okay, okay. Previously, uh, previously, uh, <laughs> previously um, we uh, give the floor to Ignacio. Let me a brief, brief introduction to our talk. Mediation and arbitration in life science and frank dispute. Fair, reasonable, and no discriminatory dispute. Uh, what are the concrete benefits of IDR, especially in the area of life science? But previous, my dear Mr. De Castro, I would like a inform that 
uh, nowadays in 2022, we have a long way since a mediation and arbitration IDR from WIPO was created. It was created in 1994 and is really a remarkable work uh, with important challenges. I, I would like to, to inform uh, Francis Gurry, nowadays Darren Tang, uh, our actual director from YPO, but also as director Ignacio de Castro in Mediation and Arbitration IDR Center, would like to remark Eric Wilbers uh, and the fantastic team who are working with you, Mr. De Castro, and uh, create an important atmosphere in which in both the place important knowledge and wisdom. We know that many companies exploit intellectual property, EP and technology internationally through collaborative agreements such as licensee, technology transfer and IR are the agreements. Uh, this means mean that cross-border disputes arise regularly with significant business, financial, and reputational impact. 15% of the cases administered by YPO arbitration and mediation center related to life science. And in recent years, the YPO center has also been dealing with a growing number of disputes regarding concerning licensee of standard essential patents under FRAM terms. So um, I see also Mr. De Castro, the online journal YPO IDR guidelines that uh, I think in April uh, you talk about FRAM dispute. Anyway, the floor is yours and let us know what are the concrete benefits of IDR, especially in the area of life science? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nazaret and Peter, for the, the kind introduction and to the Charter Institute for inviting me to participate in this uh, seminar. So Nazaret has already mentioned WIPO. Of course, WIPO is, uh, is the World Intellectual Property Organization is a specialized, specialized agency of the United Nations dealing with intellectual property and technology. And uh, we are based in Geneva. The, the center um, has been around uh, since 1994, as uh, Nazareth was mentioning. And the idea is to, to facilitate the resolution of commercial disputes involving IP and innovation. And, and the big advantage that we have is being part of of the UN, we have a global scope and we are neutral and specialized. So that means that we get um, parties involved in WIPO cases all over the world. And, and the center is particularly well known in addition to mediation and arbitration in the area of domain and disputes where we handle a, a big volume of, of cases. Um, we are seeing uh, cases in the different areas of IP, patents, and, and today we're going to be talking about patent disputes, both in, in life sciences and uh, front uh, ICT disputes. Uh, but we also deal with copyright disputes, and we are seeing a big increase in digital copyright disputes and trademarks and software disputes, but also more commercial disputes like uh, franchising, or distribution agreements, for instance. We traditionally parties in WIPO cases were European and North American, but we are seeing an increase now in parties from Asia, China, of course, uh, Korea, Singapore, uh, but also now uh, from South America. So we are seeing a big increase in um, cases involving parties from Mexico and Colombia in particular. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, the cases, as, as Nazareth was saying, came from license agreements, but we are seeing an increase in cases which are non-contractual cases, and we will talk about that later. So we are seeing pure infringement cases which go to 
to mediation or arbitration. The cases that we deal with are mostly international cases, but we also deal with cases involving parties from the same jurisdiction. And in terms of languages, uh, English and Spanish are the main languages, but Chinese is growing very fast, as you may imagine. Um, I always like to mention settlement rates because in many cases, that's the best solution for the parties involved in the dispute. Uh, we have traditionally a 70% settlement rate in mediation, but what we have seen in the last two years is that, of course, most of the uh, mediations and arbitrations that we are dealing with um, have been conducted online, and that has increased the settlement rate. We, are also, we also have seen an increase in the number of cases. So last year we saw a 45% increase, and this year we are seeing a 60% increase uh, com compared with last year. So we, we are seeing a, a big um, increase in the volume of, of cases. Uh, you were asking me about the benefits of ADR, of mediation and arbitration. Um, so the benefit uh, is, of course, the alternative is, is litigation. And many cases, many IP cases are international. So you may have um, cases in several jurisdictions. And of course, uh, patents and trademarks are territorial rights. So if you have a, a patent in, granted in, in Spain, you okay. would have to litigate in Spain. If the patent has been granted also in, in the UK, you will have to litigate in the UK. So then you have concurrent proceedings and that can be very expensive. So cost is the, the first advantage um, in an international context, that's, that's really important. Uh, of course, IP is very international, is very technical and specialized. And in many countries, you don't have specialized courts. And that's, that's a problem because the judges sometimes struggle with, with some of the Sometimes it's difficult. In these cases. Um, uh, another factor which is very important for IP disputes is that um, many technologies have a very short uh, product and, and market cycle. For instance, uh, France is, is an area where uh, mobile phones are changing all the time. You have, we used to have 3G, 4G, 5G, new technologies are changing all the time and you need to resolve disputes very quickly. And that's, that's a big advantage of mediation arbitration. Confidentiality is, is, is really important also in, in many of these cases. And, and very often uh, you have um, business secrets, know-how, uh, commercial information that you don't want to, to disclose. And the court procedures are not always well suited to protect uh, business secrets. So mediation and arbitration, and in particular, the WIPO rules have got very clear provisions on confidentiality. And finally, uh, many disputes in the IP area are very arise out of collaborations. So for instance, in the area of research and development, you may have collaborations between universities and industry. And very often, it's a long-term collaboration and parties may prefer to, to settle their dispute to continue uh, working together. So these, in my view, are the, the main advantages of mediation and arbitration for IP disputes. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what, what online options are available in WIPO, in WIPO mediation and arbitration? Uh, in other words, I think you, you just touched on that a moment ago, uh, in terms yes, of so, the growth in that, but could, could you just develop that a little bit further? Yeah. So, so of course, this, this topic is, is more and more important and has been particularly important in the last two years. So um, we were already seeing that parties were conducting uh, preparatory conferences and having um, hearings online uh, before the pandemic. But in the last two years, more than 95% of the cases that we have been administering have been conducted online. So, so what we do there is we provide um, online meeting and hearing technology for for the parties in WIPO cases, and we try to, to help them in the conduct of these cases through these tools. We have published a, a checklist on online conduct, which is available on our webpage. And we are also using what we call WIPO EADR. WIPO EADR is, a, is an online docket 
that uh, can be which is can be used by the parties in cases. Generally, it's used in, in arbitration cases, not so much in mediation cases, and it's used in cases where there are very big volumes of, of documentation, uh, pleadings and witness statements and, uh, and evidence. And it's, uh, it's an online docket which is available to parties and to the, to the arbitrators and to the center. And, um, and uh, it has the advantage that it is encrypted so it's it's safer than, than using mm -hmm. email. And, and this is something that we are seeing used in, in some very, very large cases involving including some some very large um, pharma and uh, friend related cases. Very, very, very interesting what you have explained uh, till now. And uh, now we go to know something more about how to refer cases to YPO IDR. Mm, this is a very important educational and knowledge, uh, and of course, advice how refer cases to YPO IDR. Ignacio, please. Thank you, Nazareth. Of course, this may be a little bit basic for some of the members of the, of the Charter Institute. Uh, but of course, the, the main way, the traditional way, are contract clauses. We have model contract clauses for mediation, arbitration, expedited arbitration, expert determination. They're all available on our on our web page. We also have what we call a, a clause generator that is available online, and that that allows you to 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 adjust the clauses. And and very often we see that, in particular, uh, U.S. lawyers. Uh, and looking at Peter here, they, they like to, to draft uh, lengthy uh, arbitration clauses, and, and we, we have taken some of the center's experience with these clauses uh, for to prepare the, the clause generator. So that's the, the first route is, is contract clauses, uh, which are then included in, in agreements, in license agreements, R&D agreements, etc. software agreements. The, the second way is submission agreements. And, and here what we are seeing, as I was mentioning, is, is we are seeing more and more submission agreements. So very often we, what we see is that parties may be involved in, in court litigation, sometimes in several jurisdictions, and they decide to submit a specific dispute to arbitration or to mediation. And that includes non-contractual non disputes. Um, the, the third way, and this is something that we that we changed um, um, a few years ago, is no sorry I thought I had a slide, um, is a unilateral request, and, and basically, uh, so any party can request uh, unilaterally uh, a, a wipe mediation, and this is something that we are seeing increasingly, and it happens in in situations where parties may be about to start court proceedings or even after they have started. And, and of course, we are seeing increasingly that mediation is encouraged by, by many courts. The courts are, are also very busy and, and they have, a, in, many, in many countries, they have a backlog as a result of, of the pandemic. So we are seeing that the parties are, are using these unilateral requests for mediation. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other party may not want to submit to mediation, but tactically it may be a, a sign of good faith. Uh, so this is something that we are seeing Very interesting. Uh, also in the, in the context of court referrals. So we, we see also court referrals, particularly, uh, we, we always saw court referrals from the US courts and from European courts. But now we, we are seeing quite a lot of court referrals from, from China, from the, court, from the IP courts in China. And that's a, that's an interesting development for for us at Wipo. It's very it's very interesting what you informed just now because a unilateral request from YPO mediation, a, which is your experience at the end, a final go on with the mediation procedural because uh, it must be unanimity of the parties. Uh, what happened at the end? Well, I mean, it depends. I think many many of the of these requests are 
simply ignored by the other party, so they may not reply. But, but uh, so th so there, the, of course, the settlement rate is is much lower than in, when you have a, a mediation clause in a contract. But um, the the unilateral request for mediation is is free. You don't parties don't have to pay any fees to the center or anything else. So so it's in my view, it still is a it can be a useful uh, thing to do tactically, and. Um, and in many cases, and I will talk uh, later on about France, where we are seeing these uh, unilateral requests being used uh, quite effectively. And, uh, and I will tell you later the results that we are seeing just to try to keep the audience interested. Okay. Um, I think Peter, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so what types of cases in the area of life sciences are administered by the WIPO Center? So, thank you, Peter. Um, as Nazareth mentioned earlier on, 15% uh, of cases, 15% um, uh, of WIPO cases um, relate to, to life sciences disputes. And these cases involve all the types of stakeholders that are mentioned in this slide, uh, biotech companies, large originator companies, uh, research institutions, universities, technology transfer offices, startups. So we, we see uh, very often disputes between very large uh, entities and smaller entities. So we see a disparity of the, of the parties. Uh, now we, we are also seeing in, the, in recent years and in the, in the COVID context, we are also seeing uh, that uh, non-governmental organizations are, are involved in, in these disputes. Um, and, uh, and I will tell you in a minute also about what we're doing in that area. The areas of disputes are, are again mentioned here. It's biotech, pharma, IP infringement, licensing, valuation, issues of know-how, M&A, um, uh, product liability, issues of, about royalties, prior settlement agreements, so software issues that are connected with, with uh, some of these uh, matters, bioinformatics is, is, top, is, the, uh, is the term. So, so we see a, a very large uh, type of disputes and also trademark disputes is an area where we, where we are seeing some life sciences disputes. Uh, so, this vary quite a lot. Um, I, I thought it would be useful maybe to, to give you a, a couple of examples of, of these cases. Um, the first one is a mediation case, um, which involved um, a Spanish a university and, um, and the Euro European pharmaceutical company. Uh, these, these companies, uh, the, well, these entities had a, a patent uh, option, patent license option, and they were trying to negotiate a license. They could not agree on the terms of this license, and, uh, and the, the option agreement did not include a, a WIPO mediation clause. But here, uh, the alternative was litigation in, in France or litigation in Spain. Um, here, the, the parties uh, decided to, to submit the dispute to, to WIPO mediation and they wanted someone appointed as mediator who had to be a, a licensing, a pharma licensing expert. So we, we have the parties to, to appoint um, a mediator with that uh, expertise. And they, they, they met, they met in, in a neutral location in London. They conducted uh, the mediation and uh, as a result of this meeting, the, the parties were able to, to negotiate um, a, a license agreement, which was effectively a settlement of the dispute. Um, and this is something that, that is quite interesting because it's using mediation to, to, to negotiate um, an agreement. And that's, that's something that we are seeing increasingly. The, the second case is, a, is an arbitration case. Uh, here, these are two large pharma companies. And here they, they had a sub-license uh, relating a, a, a product which was jointly owned um, 
and um, they had a joint development agreement regarding uh, some cancer treatment. And in this um, agreement, uh, they again, they, they did not have uh, uh, an arbitration clause, but they decided to, to submit to arbitration part of their dispute. So here they wanted to focus on the, on the assignment of the patents and uh, the determination of, of the royalties and also issues regarding the, the ownership of the patents. So here, uh, the, the arbitral tribunal issued an award uh, on, on concerning these matters, patent ownership and royal, royalty rates. And they also um, had to deal with, with some other procedural issues, uh, admissibility of expert witnesses reports and, and what was the scope of the, of the discovery in this case. So, so these are some examples of, of the types of disputes that we see in life sciences. And I just want to ask a quick follow-up question because we're, we're actually doing pretty well on time. And, and I saw a couple slides back where you had mentioned governmental agencies um, as, as, potent, as parties sometimes. And I find that kind of interesting because I always kind of saw this as kind of a, you know, private parties. Um, actually, you know, in my own past, I, years ago when it was in tobacco, and we, we were fighting against plain packaging. And, and I remember looking at, at potent, you know, what, what if we did this it, with WIPO arbitration rather than ICSID arbitration or, WTO uh, dispute resolution, and I'm just just want to. I, I know it's not on the slides, but I'm just curious what your thoughts might be on on those type. And again, I, I, you said government agency, so I'm just curious what type of cases. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, your question is very interesting, Peter, and, and in fact, it's interesting that you mention uh, the plain uh, packaging for. for I, I lived that. Reason. I lived that in in my soul. Okay. Well, so, uh, <laughs> was, was there uh, 15 or 20 years? Are in-house lawyer and uh, okay. advising. <laughs> well, anyway. uh, we, we, of course, we are in Geneva, and WTO is in Geneva also. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, part of that dispute uh, was, was taking place in Geneva. And, and we, we were also contacted in relation to, to some of those disputes. And, and we were asked by, by some of these um, government agencies whether WIPO was able to deal with these disputes. And the answer is, is yes, we, we, we can deal with um, disputes involving, I mean, of course, as you say, the, the, the normal parties to, to WIPO cases are, are companies, private sector companies or private sector entities, but no, no, nothing stops us from dealing with uh, disputes between one public entity and, uh, and a company or two public entities between themselves. And, and of course, once again, some, some of the advantages of, of, of um, submitting that type of dispute to, to, to wipe or mediation or arbitration is, is confidentiality. Because as, uh, many of these cases that uh, take place between WTO become highly public and, and political. And, and I'm not sure that that is, is, um, is, is particularly useful for, for, for the parties in those cases. So, yeah, so yes, to, we are able yeah. to deal with, with those I mean, cases. I don't, I don't mean to, 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 to criticize the ICSID panel, but I imagine a WIPO panel probably would have been better placed to consider those cases than, than investment uh, yeah, yeah, law yeah. experts. But, and, and, and the other, the other point is, is of course, uh, we, we are in contact with the colleagues at WTO and at ICSID. And yeah. of course, we, we are always very happy to, to, to make some, some recommendations for potential um, arbitrators or members of their panels, you know, for, because we, we have, as you, as you mentioned, we have a very big you know, database of, of experts in the different uh, areas of IP and technology. So, so we have on occasions, also trying to try to help our colleagues in, in other organizations such as ICSID or WTO. I'm sorry to hijack this. It, it no, just, no, I couldn't, no, I couldn't no, resist it's, asking. No, no. <laughs> it, 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 it gave me the opportunity to, to explain uh, that, that that is possible for sure.
Anyway, we, we move uh, on the same, but uh, I, I, I know, and I would like that you inform me, Ignacio, uh, what uh, concerning uh, the pandemic uh, situation and uh, your sensibility considering a response uh, package uh, YPO COVID-19 uh, can you inform our audience what have you done and you are doing now? Thank you, Nazareth. Um, I have quite a few slides for this, uh, this uh, question because uh, we, we have been working quite a lot in, in this area in the last year and a half. Yeah. And our uh, new director general has is putting quite a lot of emphasis on, on, on WIPO trying to, to, to help in this COVID uh, situation. Uh, and also to, to, to try to avoid the perception that that IP um, can be an obstacle to, to some of the problems uh, of COVID. So um, from, from our side, uh, of course, we, we offer mediation, arbitration, expert determination. What we, what we have tried to do is to, to develop some, some new tailored procedures to, to try to assist with, with um, this new situation um, and, uh, and some of the, um, the emergency, particularly in relation to access to medicine in, in developing countries. Um, so what we, what we have done is using also the, the experience of the case that I mentioned, for instance, on the, the patent uh, license option, we have developed a, a new uh, mediation option to facilitate the negotiation of agreements. So, so basically, these can be agreements between big pharma companies and uh, the public authorities of, of some of uh, some develop, de developing countries. And we are, have also developed a, a new dispute resolution board procedure, which I will explain in a, in a minute. So, so the standard clause is, is, is this, is mediation submitted by arbitration. It's available on our website. But what we, and this is the, the Article 4 unilateral request, I will not um, go on more about this, but um, on, on the life sciences uh, contracts in, in, as part of the COVID package, of course, mm -hmm. there are different phases of, of, of contracts, pre-contract, conclusion of contract, and the performance of the contract. So what we, what we feel is that mediation can play a role in all the different phases. And, and we have seen that already. And, um, and, and so that is something that we, that we have done as part of these options. So as part of contract negotiation, you can also use mediation and then we have developed uh, some clauses for this and the, and the mediator who, who gets appointed uh, to facilitate the contract negotiation, of course, can also deal if the parties want him to do that they, he can also, the, the mediator can also deal with disputes during the, the, the collaboration at different stages. Of course, in, in some situations, the mediation will help to, to, to settle the, the whole dispute, but sometimes it may not. And in that situation, of course, you can then go to arbitration to get an arbitration award. As a one, third one term, question. I see here, excuse me, uh, dispute RB is per determination or also early neutral evaluation? Uh, um, I mean, we don't make the distinction between early neutral evaluation and DRB. So, so here we, we are looking at, um, at DRB as a kind of expert determination, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I will uh, explain a little bit. So this is the, the mediation submission agreement and the, and the facilitation of of, of negotiations between the contract of, between the parties when they, they have different experience, different expertise of this type of contracts. And that, that is a big part of the problem. It, then it may be useful to have a, a mediator who has seen this type of agreements and can explain in, in, in separate sessions with the parties, in focus meetings, how um, this type of contracts are normally negotiated. So, so this, for this, we have a, 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 a list of mediators who are experts in life sciences and they can uh, facilitate the contract negotiation. But that mediator can also continue as a standing mediator 
for um, disputes that may arise later on. So, so this is, we have some model clauses which um, provide for these options. Um, so that's for the mediator. And, and uh, Ignacio, uh, one mediator or co-mediations? Of course, you, you can have uh, one mediator or, or co-mediators. Of course, um, we see sometimes co-mediators in, in the very large cases, and sometimes you may have a mediator who may be more like a lawyer and maybe someone with a technical background as co-mediator. Yeah. So we see that in some of the big cases, but of course that, that has a cost. Uh, here, what we're trying to do is, because it's, it's about, um, um, for instance, long-term supply or manufacturing agreements, mm -hmm. then we, we try to find people who are lawyers with that type of background. They may be former in-house lawyers that, and they have seen many of these agreements and those are the perfect mediators. And that, of course, if you only have one mediator, that reduces the cost. If you have co-mediators, it can be expensive. But, but the, both options are, are available to the parties. So okay. if we move to dispute resolution boards, so here uh, the idea is that you could even have a, a mediator uh, who participated in the contract negotiation appointed uh, as, as a as a sole member of, of the board, if, if that person was sufficiently knowledgeable, but also you can choose to have three members appointed once a dispute arises. And the idea is to, is to try to, to facilitate the resolution of the of disputes, whether they are minor disputes in the course of the performance of the agreement, or uh, to wait until there is a bigger dispute. And uh, this is kind of based on the on the WIPO expert determination rules. And uh, it, of course, it can also be followed, as I was showing in the diagram, by uh, arbitration. So um, here we have, again, some, some clauses about uh, the, the functioning of the DRB, always by reference to the, to the expert determination rules. Mm -hmm. The composition of the board uh, gives several options, as, as I was mentioning. And um, also the, the term of appointment is, is described. And then there are issues like um, information sharing, which may be appropriate, for instance, uh, when they are very heavy projects and, and you can then have monthly or quarterly updates in the course of the project so that the members of the DRB are really completely up to date with the project. So, so this is something that, that we have um, just developed. Um, uh, we launched this in October, and we are now working on a, on a guide that we are going to publish after the summer. Um, okay. the, the, the other details are available also as part of these clauses. All the clauses are, are available online. So I think I will not um, go into, into more detail unless you want me to do. Um, interesting. Well, I guess, you know, this kind of tees up now the, 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 the I, I think probably, but I'm not going to say the most interesting part of the whole time. I mean, I think something that we're very curious to hear your thoughts on. I mean, given, you know, we're in this, this new world of the internet of things and it, it's all about interconnectivity, it's all about streaming services, etc. cetera. My, my guess would be you're, you must be seeing quite a few friend cases. So I, I don't know, let's tee this off and talk, of, just start off and ask you directly, what, what is your, your experience in this area right now? Okay, so um, we, we started working on, on this topic of uh, friend, uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing terms uh, some six years ago. And, um, and, and we, we, I mean, there were already some disputes uh, I, I'm sure you all remember the, the Samsung uh, Apple dispute, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the big disputes involving Huawei, Nokia, Ericsson, some very, very large uh, patent holders. Um, and uh, as, as Nazareth was mentioning, um, the, the technical standardization process is, is quite uh, complex. 
uh, you have the standard setting organizations. Um, uh, for instance, in Europe, we have ETSI, is the European Telecom Standards Institute. And, and what ETSI does is they, they create new standards, uh, 4G, 5G, etc. And, and, and basically what, what they do is they, they have as their members all the companies that I mentioned, and these companies declare, in the, when they create a technical standard, they will declare some of their patents to be essential to that technology. And as part of that declaration, they, they make um, a commitment to license their standard essential patents to the other potential users, implementers of that technology. So, of course, FRAND doesn't mean anything. Fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory are, are very general terms which can be interpreted in, in many ways. And, and really, yeah. um, what, we, what, we, what we have done is we, we've developed a document, a guidance document, which is available on our webpage. And we have also um, done, developed uh, some, some options, uh, mediation and arbitration to, to deal with these type of disputes. These are the standard procedures that, that we have. But what we have done is we, we have developed some specific clauses to try to facilitate the resolution of these cases, because these cases can be very, very complex. Um, some of these standards involve thousands of patents, and, and some of these companies have huge portfolios of patents, and they declare them, and, and, and often they license the entire portfolio to, to a party. Uh, so then, in, when they are trying to negotiate the license, of course, the other party, the, the implementer of the standard, another company, for instance, a, a mobile phone manufacturer that may not have all these patents, they, then there will be questions as to whether the, the patents that had been declared were truly essential, whether they were even valid, because many mm -hmm. patents are granted, but it's not always clear that uh, they are, if, if you go to court, you may manage to to turn them, uh, to yeah. make them invalid. Um, they may be infringed as part of the manufacturing of that product. And, and there may be also issues of, of cross-licensing because the two companies may, may have some patents. So the, the idea is to, to try to define the scope as part of the procedure to, to try to, to make the process manageable, to, to try to also focus on what is the geographical scope of the mediation of the arbitration, because of course these patents are protected in, in many countries, in the US, in China, in Germany, in Spain, whatever. So that can be done through, through a case management conference where the, the arbitrators can, can do some process, for instance, to, to try to, to focus on a sample of the patents in that portfolio and try to, to organize the, the process, to bifurcate it, to, to try to mock the, the process as, as effective as possible. Um, and, and of course, we don't go into what is the substantive methodology to, de to determine what uh, a friend royalty means. So that, that is something that we, we try to keep away from because of course, the parties in these cases will try to use different methodologies and will use experts, um, economists and accountants to, to look at different methodologies. Uh, we'll have a list of. Let me ask a, a quick before jumping into this. I mean, I just want to ask a, a quick question just to get your opinion on it. Because as I look at this, I mean, the, the, the problem that, that standard organizations would have is that, you know, you have all sorts of people in, in the organization. In other words, you have users, you have manufacturers, you have licensors, licensees, and so you have big companies, you have small companies. And so you know, how on earth can you ever really develop a standard that's going to make everybody in the organization happen? And, and therefore, how could you ever really define what fair and reasonable actually means um, or discrimination, what that actually means? And, and so in a sense, they, because of the, just the nature of the organization, it gives rise to these problems. And I, I don't see much of a solution. So my, my question is whether or not WIPO is has actual, I don't know, a, a 
discussions um, directly with the standards organizations to, to maybe kind of nip these problems in the bud, so to speak, uh, if, if possible. I, I don't know. I'm just curious. And of course, this, this, uh, this, this is very, very big business. This is very big mm. business. And, and the, the participants in standard setting have got their own agendas. Okay. And, and these agendas change, change very quickly. So, I mean, when, when we started looking at these, uh, we had Blackberries, and that was era <laughs> RIM. RIM had uh, plenty of patents, but uh, they were a manufacturer. They're no longer a manufacturer. So, so I think you, you can see that the, 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 the industry changes all the time. So, yes, uh, the, the standard setting process maybe has not uh, adapted to the, to the new situations or, or to the changing situations. And I mean, my, my, I mean, my, my personal impression of this sector is that um, the, 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 the standard setting process work better when, when there was a smaller group of, of companies participating in, in the creation of these standards. But, but you cannot stop um, companies uh, joining this, this business. And, and, and in particular, of course, uh, Asia, Asia, uh, Asian companies are incredibly active in, in this type of technologies. And, and we see from, 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 from WIPO's perspective, uh, you know, we, we administer the, the patent cooperation treaty and the big uh, fires of PCT applications are very often companies that are involved in, in patent standards. So we have uh, companies like Samsung or Huawei, ZTE, many, many Asian companies are, are very active in, in this area. And, and of course, that, that has created some, some tensions in this, in this, in this process. And, and some companies uh, have um, a very historical involvement in, in this in this area, and in particular, some of the European companies have, or, or some of the American companies, uh, Motorola also, <laughs> remember, I mean, they, but I mean, they, they, there are plenty of new uh, handset manufacturers. And, 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 and on top of that, as you were mentioning, uh, now we have internet of things. And that, that makes it even more complicated. So, so uh, I was at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and that included uh, people from, the, from the, the, the big German car manufacturers who are talking about connected cars that use these, these technologies. And, and, and these are not options in these, in these new cars. This is really a essential. And it's not just cars. It, it may be fridges. It may be any, any device, you know? So, so it's, it's very difficult to... to I mean, it's, it's the usual situation where, where the, the, the legal systems, the law is, is, is far behind the, from the, the kind of the, the technological developments. The technological developments happen very quickly. And then that, that creates tensions. And that's where um, disputes arise. And, and, and in a way, because of, the, of all the factors uh, in these disputes, mediation and arbitration are, are very good alternatives to resolve the disputes because otherwise you can go country by country litigating these these disputes and that may be good for lawyers but not not every company can can afford it and it depends always depends but better idea solution effective and collaborative and mm -hmm. uh, reduce time what do you think, Peter? About, about, uh, I do. I, of course. I mean, how can, how can you argue with that? I mean, but I, I'm interested, Ignacio, like, and in, in how. I mean, because there, there's so many issues that that arise from this about, you know, patentability, um, and, and how that, for example, that would change from one country to another. Um, in other words, how difficult just the very nature of these disputes that that are they even amenable. Are, can they be handled better by arbitration than by litigation insofar as there will be issues, at least in some countries, that aren't, aren't even arbitrable? So 
you know, and there and therefore you're going to have this parallel litigation or anti-suit injunctions. And you're going to have the same mess yeah. that you have in ordinary jurisdiction. So I'm just curious, what I mean, I, I you know, I don't I don't mean to to get contentious here, but I mean, how do you see WIPO arbitration dealing with the this problems like worldwide licenses any any better than New York? For example. Yeah. I mean, let me just finish just presenting this option. Sure. Yes, yes, yes. I'll yes. try to answer. Sorry. So, so I'll be very quick. So, so of course, for these cases, also, we have a list of mediators and arbitrators knowledgeable about this area. Parties can use um, EADR. We, we can have interim measures granted by, by, the, by the arbitrators, once appointed or by the courts. We can have tailored procedures. We have flexibility on, on applicable law, language and place of arbitration, the, the general advantages of arbitration, confidentiality, the finality of the award, uh, and then, of course, the international enforceability under the New York Convention. And now to answer your question, <laughs> I mean, for the, for the last um, years, we, 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 we worked on the, all these options and, and this guidance. And, and, and we were not getting many cases. We were not getting many cases. We were getting inquiries. And we could see that, that parties involved in these disputes were, were still litigating. But in the last two years, we, we have seen a change. We have seen a change. And, and what we are seeing uh, is we, we are starting to see mediation being used um, quite frequently. So we, we, we have had more than uh, 55 cases in this area. Um, and, and, and I have tried to summarize these cases in, in this slide and the next. So, so first of all, we, we, we are seeing cases uh, involving a, a patent pool administrator that has uh, some, some very valuable uh, 4G uh, patents. And, they, and there's a, a whole um, group of implementers or companies in, in, in many jurisdictions in, in, in Europe, but also in, in China, India, Japan, Korea. And um, again, the, here there's no contract. It's just basically the, the patent pool uh, administrator says, well, we have these patents. You are infringing our patents. And you need a, a front license. And, they, and normally the, the, the implementers did not respond did not respond at all. Uh, so what this company has started using, has, has started doing in, in a kind of systematic way is they have said, okay, well, we are going to start a unilateral request for mediation and we, we, we are ready to mediate these cases. And, and what they have found is that in, in many cases, the other party has responded positively to that request. And sometimes they, they, they will appoint uh, mediators and sometimes they will simply start negotiating. And, and that's, that's been a, a very interesting experience. And, and we, we are seeing quite a number of, of cases of this time. The, the other way in which we have been starting to, to get uh, these front uh, cases is, is cases where you have litigation, litig litigation pending in, in several, in one uh, jurisdiction or in, or in several jurisdictions. And then they, the, the parties will decide uh, to, to stay, to, to suspend the court proceedings, and then to, to move to, to mediation, either through a unilateral request or through a joint uh, agreement to, to submit to mediation. And then the, the final way in which we are getting these cases is, is, is from the courts in China. And, and it's, it's quite interesting because China has uh, now some, some specialized IP courts in, in some cities in, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. And the, the courts of China are using mediation quite regularly. They have a huge caseload of, of cases, often cases filed by, by non-Chinese companies against Chinese companies. And so as part of that, we, we have started receiving some some cases that go to to white mediation, and then they they are sometimes uh, successfully settled. So so this is what we are seeing. Um, 
I mean, there, there is a um, discussion as to whether uh, the, the standard setting organizations should make um, arbitration compulsory for this type of disputes. My, 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 my personal view is that I don't think that would, that would work. Uh, and, and, and for instance, the, there is a, a very well-known judge in, in the UK that has been making this proposal for, for the last year. He's been suggesting that the, that the rules of some of the standard setting organizations get changed to make arbitration compulsory. That uh, proposal so far has not been accepted. And, and I, I would think that that many of the of the companies that are involved in, in standard setting, they, they are very, very sophisticated companies and they, and they use the different uh, ways of resolving disputes very tactically. So I, I think they, they would not, I don't think they would welcome something like compulsory arbitration. Maybe, maybe some form of, of compulsory mediation could be possible, but, but even there, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be accepted by, by some of these companies. In your slides, um, you, 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 you seem to you, you talk a, quite a bit about wipe out mediation. And, and I'm just, maybe this is a stupid question, but I mean, do you, in your experience, you, you, do, you, do, you, do you prefer wipe out mediation to wipe out arbitration for friend disputes? I and mean, what do you? Or, or maybe I, I, um, I, I ask um, in relation to what has Peter said. Maybe from it is a Singapore convention is prefer more mediation YPO on Asian countries than arbitration. What what do you consider? You, you see, my, my impression is that for for fran disputes, um, I think arbitration may be a bit scary for for some of the parties. And the, and the fact that arbitration is, is final may be a bit concerning to, to some of these companies because the, the, the value of these patents is, 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 is too high, you know? So it's, it's something, we, we see something similar sometimes in, in pharma for very, very valuable patents. Uh, some, some companies are, are, are concerned that arbitration is final. And we have even seen cases where they had arbitration clauses where the, the, the award was not final and could be subject to, to an appeal, which is very, very unusual, of course, in arbitration. So, so I think that, I mean, initially when we started working in the area of front, we thought we were going to, to be dealing with more arbitration cases, but, uh, but the reality is that what we are seeing is, is mediation. And, and we are, of course, we, we have no preference. We would love to see some some friend arbitrations, but uh, but the reality is that parties seem to be more more comfortable with with mediation. Yeah, I, my question was, 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 was too simple. I mean, it's, it's, you're right; it's not a question of preference. But I, I guess my question is: Do you think that mediation lends itself, or is better suited to these uh, to these disputes? I, I, guess. I, I think mediation. I mean, to me, mediation is is, is such a flexible procedure that it can mean anything. So, so for instance, we have two, two very large FRAN mediation cases. In one, we, we have a mediator who is uh, very experienced in, in, in patent disputes, but he is he's having to play a very facilitative role. So he's, he's just not trying to express any opinion at all on, on, the, on what is FRAN or not. In the other case, we have, uh, the parties have chosen to have uh, a mediator and this mediator is, is, a, is a former Chinese judge. And, and so he, he is very incredibly evaluative. So he, he, he really is going to tell the parties what a friend license should be like and what should be the royalty rate. So, so it's, mediation can mean very different things, but, but I think in a way the the great advantage of mediation is, is that flexibility is that you can that the mediator can can give to the parties what they want and, and sometimes you see that the parties choose a particular mediator 
because they want one thing or, or another, you know, an evaluation or, or just simply someone who is going to, to facilitate. It sounded a moment ago that you, you seem to suggest that-, that it's Sorry, Peter, I cannot hear you very well there. Oh, I'm sorry. It, I, I got the impression before that you, you seemed to suggest that it was more fac facultative than, than evaluative in, in that. But, no, but normally, that's not necessarily normally it's more, you're right, normally it's more facilitative, but, yep. uh, but sometimes we, we get these evaluative mediations and it's, it's very cultural, very, very cultural. So we, we have seen also some very evaluative mediations in, in, in Germany where the parties wanted to have a, a former judge also to, to, to evaluate a, a dispute based on, on what would happen otherwise if the parties went to court. And, and of course, when you have cases that may be pending in court and, and, and the parties simply uh, stay the, the court proceedings, then of course it, it's, it can be quite, um, quite useful to have that evaluation uh, made by, by, a, by a mediator. So, yeah. I think the flexibility is, is quite useful. Now, Zarete asked a moment ago about the Singapore Convention, and you know, I, I, I'm not sure what your view is. I mean, insofar as you know, no, I, as far as I can see, no, no European country has ratified yet, and not quite sure why. Uh, I think I think it's the Brits are consulting on it, but but I, I'm not. I don't really see much movement elsewhere. I'm just curious, um, just from from sitting from the perspective of WIPO, how you view that. Uh, where you might see that going? I mean, from from our perspective, we 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 think that we that we think that the Singapore Convention is is a great thing. It's it's kind of almost like an equivalent of the New York Convention. Uh, so I think for us, it's it's a it's a very positive development. Uh, but as you say, some some countries are, are Europe uh, European countries have not um, adopted. Uh, I mean, we, we were doing some, some research on this, and there seemed to be some issues of, of competence between the, the, the European Commission and the member states. So I don't know how that will be resolved. Um, hopefully that, that gets some blocked and it becomes more widespread. I, I think for me, the, the big advantage of the Singapore Convention is, is of course, it, it puts mediation more on the, on the agenda. And, and gives that uh, that um, that uh, enforcement tool uh, if if needed. But um, but our our experience at WIPO is that generally mediation agreements are enforced by the parties voluntarily. So so we don't. I mean, of course, the parties agree to to a settlement agreement, and normally they they comply with it. So so I'm I'm not really sure how often. It would, it would be used, even in the case of arbitration awards. Um, I mean, we are, I think IP disputes are, are different from, from other types of disputes. I think uh, my, my impression is that, for instance, if in the area of investment disputes, parties may be more reluctant to, to enforce awards and, and they will be challenging and applying to set aside awards. But in, in the area of IP, we don't see that many challenges. So I think- uh, we... And, in, and in, in these uh, challenges, uh, because uh, uh, we are at the, at the end and we, we want to open to the audience, but I would like uh, previously, uh, what are the trends considering uh, life science uh, now and, and, and future, Ignacio, what, what do you think? Uh, also copyrights on digital disputes is a newest trend? Yeah, so, so thank you, Nathalie. So what we are seeing is, is of course, first of all, in, in, in relation to the conduct of mediation and arbitration cases, we are seeing that parties now that after COVID are continuing to, to try to, to do meetings and hearings online yeah. as often as possible. So that's, that's uh, one, one trend that we are seeing. Um, but as you say, um, what we, we are seeing more front disputes, 
Um, we are also seeing quite a lot of uh, digital copyright disputes. And, and there it's, it's quite interesting because, um, again, some, so there's some new legislation, and, and particularly in Europe, there, there is the, um, the digital copyright directive that really encourages the use of, of ADR to, to resolve disputes. So we, we have been doing quite a lot of work in that area, and we are seeing quite a number of, of disputes, sometimes disputes involving um, online platforms, online content service providers, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, for instance, uh, collective management organizations, copyright collective management organizations, or, or users, or, or simply uh, users um, that are posting uh, content online. So these are, are very small disputes, uh, and, and those, those are, um, are starting to get resolved uh, through ADR, and, and that's an area where we, we are trying to, to, to do more work. Um, and we, 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 we are seeing already uh, quite a lot of cases, um, and in particular, we, we, we're working quite a lot with, um, with Mexico and, and Colombia uh, that, that have some mediation procedures to, to deal with some of these copyright disputes, and we are seeing a big increase in that area. And so, so we keep uh, moving from in, into different areas, and that's, yeah. that's quite interesting. But that's uh, quite away from the topic of today. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, I think Peter, we can open to the audience let's see. and let's see. let's see what questions we have here. Yeah. Let's see. We have one question. A uh, short question for the end of the presentation. How do you think these new areas, which are making a huge impact in every legal system, are changing the practice of arbitration and mediation, even within the WIPO? Also, could this way of resolving disputes online affect the courts of national jurisdictions? If so, how does it affect it? So it's a, a couple of questions here, but I guess just to sum, how, how do you think these new areas, which are making a huge impact in every legal system, how are they changing the practice of arbitration and mediation? even within WIPO? Well, um, the, the online con conduct is, is a big thing. It's, it's, it's a big change for us. And, um, and in a way, perhaps the, the increase in the, in the volume of cases that we are seeing is a result of, of, of the courts not being able to, to, to provide that, that level of ser service, particularly in, in the COVID situation. So of course, um, we, we the, the, the courts were not able to, to adapt as quickly as, as ADR can adapt to, to these different uh, uh, situations. And, and, and in a way, uh, I mean, we, we are seeing that, that some courts, and, and again, I'm going to talk about China. Some, some of, the, of the Chinese courts are, are, are moving very fast in their adoption of technology. So, so they, they're starting to have um, online dockets, they're starting to have um, online hearings. So I think some of the things that we are seeing in mediation and arbitration are happening in courts, uh, but, but I don't know if, if it's happening quickly enough, you know? But, but clearly there, there is some, some connection with, or some um, adaptation based on, on what we are seeing in, in, in mediation and arbitration. And, and of course, it's, it's also connected with, um, with all these uh, um, projects. So for instance, we, we are part of these uh, uh, green, green arbitration, uh, greener arbitration project. And mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there, there's, there's a number of, of these projects uh, in, in different places. And, and we, we think that that is, that is unavoidable, no? that, that, uh, that perhaps uh, the, the days of, uh, um, arbitrators meeting in, in, in an hotel in Geneva for, for several weeks, maybe, maybe that's less likely to happen in the future. What a shame. For the parties, I think it's, it's, it's a big saving. It's, uh, 
it, I think it makes it much more. Just, just the, just the savings in, in, in photocopies alone, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> when it comes to these international disputes, but, but, you know, on that topic, because you, you had spoken just related to this question, I mean, because you had, you had spoken before about your, your online platform at WIPO and, you know, and, and you're seeing people like, you know, like, like, I, I guess that the ICC just issued uh, another round of, of guidance on, on kind of online hearings and, you know, digital technology and arbitration I, and CRB as well, just issued guidelines earlier this year, I think in February. Um, are you, one of the, the themes that runs through this, right, is, is the, you know, the potential, I guess, of you know, denial of justice or, you know, unequal, in other words, that you, you, you have, uh, inequality of arms, right? You have some very well-resourced party against somebody who's not so well-resourced. And that that can be, I think that at least one of the themes that runs through these guidelines, right? Is that the, that can be abused uh, in an online um, environment. But, but you see, you, I think it was always the case, you know? Yeah. I mean, for instance, I, I was thinking about, we had a, a case uh, which involved um, uh, a software developer, a young guy based in, in Seattle in the US. And, and, and this guy had uh, developed uh, uh, some software and, and this software was being distributed, dis distributed and packaged by, by a company in, in London, mm -hmm. in the UK. And, and they had um, in that contract, uh, which was an interesting contract, it was just simply a a click through agreement. What they what happened is um, basically the, the software developer, the, the young guy, accepted to have WIPO expedited arbitration in London. Um, and then they had a dispute. Then they had a dispute and 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 there was he could not afford to, to travel to London for the hearing. So uh, what 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 happened in that case is one party requested a, 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 an in-person hearing and, and that had to be in London because that's what the contract said. So the, the software developer participated from Seattle into a video conference, which was the hearing, but the, the other party was present mm -hmm. at that, uh, that meeting. So, so there was an, an inequality of, of, between the parties and and a huge difference in, in, in resources. So that has always happened mm -hmm. in my view. And, and perhaps maybe this balances the, the situation because you, you have both parties participating online. Yeah. And, and in a way, I mean, what we, what we have found, I also remember kind of people saying, oh, but you cannot see uh, the behavior of witnesses or, or right. a witness can be coached by someone in the background or, right. or but, but I, I don't know, I think to me, over the last two years, this has been the norm. And I haven't really heard of- Total agree. Of many problems, you know? See, si. total agree. I, I, I would like that you know that the, the audience uh, today is really international, Ignacio. We have from Nassau, Bahamas, from Malaysia, from New Delhi, India, uh, and also uh, from uh, Zurich, not so far from, from you, and, and also here in, in, in Madrid. Uh, we, in this moment, um, don't have more questions, and you know this is a meet with, and I would like, uh, it's a pleasure, I would like to express that it's a pleasure to host the YPO and, and you, Ignacio de Castro. And really it was a pleasure joining with uh, Peter Namias, uh, Antonia Musategui, our chair, uh, uh, could not attend us uh, for a uh, imprevis uh, situation at the low office. And I think our Peter Namias was really uh, a wonderful a collaborator, a moderator. But of course, uh, Ignacio, uh, my votes are for a new encounter shortly here in Iberian Chapter uh, from European brands. The are really welcome. 
And especially in the case of having from WIPO covered some steps in their project of evaluation standard guidelines for technology projects, uh, pretty, pretty need to the times for, for coming. What, what would you like to remark uh, here in these few minutes? Uh, thank you. I think we, we've said it all. I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm talked out and... Uh, no, okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, I, I, again, thank you very much to the, to the Charter Institute for, for inviting the, the WIPO Center to, to, to participate. Uh, and uh, thank you, Nazareth, Antonio, and, and Peter also for, for, for all your questions. Uh, and uh, I mean, I look forward to, to future collaboration on, on different topics and uh, please don't, don't hesitate to, to contact us if we, if we can be of any, any assistance. And, and of course, if the, if, the, if the participants have got any uh, questions that they, they want to ask directly, they should not hesitate to, to write to, to, to the generic email address, arbiter mail at WIPO, and, and we can uh, answer their questions or, or have follow-up discussions we, we get quite a lot of questions um, when it comes to the, to the drafting of clauses. Um, and, um, yeah. and, and unfortunately, uh, we, we, we keep receiving uh, cases where, where the clauses are, are problematic. Um, and, and in a way, they, 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 we were always very happy to, to share our, our experience and, and try to to, to assist in the drafting of clauses to, to try to have a, avoid uh, problems later on if there is a dispute. Thank you. And uh, for the audience, of course, the slides will be available uh, afterwards. And also uh, you have a play bill with a resume concerning this seminar. And also I uh, just informed our uh, honorable panelists uh, you can contact directly and the Hugh information. Also, this is recording and you will have, and you can see on detail later on as your convenience. Uh, thank you very much and uh, really uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. you, Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Ignacio. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.